Treaty defends the destruction of a seized ship that was smuggling stolen oil. We'll have these stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. UNICEF warns that an unprecedented number of children are likely to die in drought-stricken, famine-prone Somalia without greater immediate action from the international community to provide life-saving assistance. Lisa Schlein reports from Geneva. Somalia has endured four consecutive years of failed rains and is facing a possible fifth season of drought. This has destroyed people's ability to feed themselves and has forced millions to uproot themselves in search of something to eat and essential basic relief. The humanitarian crisis is having a particularly disastrous impact on children. UNICEF reports the number of severely acutely malnourished children is skyrocketing. In August alone, it reports that 44,000 children with severe acute malnutrition were admitted to health facilities for emergency treatment. Speaking from Dolo, Somalia, UNICEF spokesman James Elder says this means today in Somalia, a child is admitted to a health care facility every single minute of every single day. Four severely acutely malnourished children are 11 times more likely to die um, of diarrhea and measles and so on than well-nourished children. So with rates like those I've mentioned, Somalia really is on the brink of a tragedy at a scale not seen in decades. And of course, the children behind what is a staggering, slightly appalling statistic are those who make it to a treatment centre. Elder notes that many people are prevented from getting the help they need because of ongoing instability in the country and the dangers posed by the Islamist militant al-Shabaab group. In response, he says UNICEF is deploying mobile teams to find and treat malnourished children in hard-to-reach locations. When people speak of the crisis facing Somali and Somalians today, it's become very common to make these frightful comparisons to the famine, of course, of 2011, when around 260,000 people, half of those children, died. However, everything I'm hearing on the ground, from nutritionists to famine experts to pastoralists, is that things today actually, unfortunately, look worse. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates 7.8 million people in Somalia are affected by the drought, including more than 1.1 million displaced people. Ocha reports famine is projected in Baidoa and Buhakaba districts in Bay region between now and December if humanitarian aid does not reach people most in need. As of now, 45% of the UN's $2.26 billion appeal has been funded. Lisa Schlein for VOA News, Geneva. The International Monetary Fund says it has reached a staff-level agreement with Somalia that would allow the release of $10 million to the country. The agreement is expected to be approved by the board when it meets in December. According to Reuters, IMF Mission Chief Laura Jaramillo praised authorities for sticking to economic reforms. She said with continued progress, the country could participate in HIPC, the heavily indebted poor country's debt forgiveness process. That would allow Somalia to cut its debt from over $5 billion to about $550 million. It would also open up financing to promote growth and support development programs. Nigeria's defense chief has defended the destruction of a seized ship that was smuggling stolen oil, saying no investigation was needed. Critics say the military's burning of the ship last week destroyed vital evidence and accused the military of a cover-up. Timothy Abiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. Nigeria's defense chief, General Loki Rabo, spoke after last Friday's national security meeting with the president. Irabo said the swift response of security operatives followed the rules of engagement and that they didn't need to carry out any investigation because the ship was caught in the act. Security operatives last week seized and burned an 87-meter-long vessel allegedly carrying 650,000 liters of crude oil in southern Delta State. 
The vessel had seven crew members aboard. The bus was one of the biggest in recent weeks, led by former Delta State militant government Ekwemupolo, widely known as Tompolo. Nigerian authorities in August awarded him a multi-billion dollar surveillance contract in a desperate bid to address rampant oil theft. On Sunday, popular human rights lawyer Femi Falano called for the removal of the defense chief. Human rights lawyer Marshall Abubakar said he agrees and says the burning of the ship is highly suspicious. Why the hurry in destroying these vessels? There has been allegations that the menace of oil theft is being perpetrated by uh, persons and authorities. The horrid uh, destruction lends credence to that, to that particular allegation. Experts say Nigeria has been losing thousands of barrels and millions of dollars every day to crude oil theft. The ex-militant's company has so far uncovered 58 instances of oil being siphoned from pipelines including one connected to Nigeria's major export line where oil was tapped unnoticed for nine years. Tompolo has also alleged that security operatives, oil companies and local residents usually collude to steal oil. Last week, lawmakers promised to investigate the matter and make public their findings. Abuja-based lawyer and economist Eze Onyekbire says the burning of the ship will make any investigation more difficult. When you apprehend an offender, you will need evidence to be able to prove before a court of law that such a person committed the offense in question. The vessel on which the crude oil is carried is one of those pieces of evidence that you need to prove before a court of law. Abubakar also worries about environmental damage. The destruction of these vessels in open space without uh, a proper paraphernalia to protect the ozone layer is an injustice to the struggles and the environmental rights of the Nigerian people. Critics are waiting for answers and monitoring what authorities do next. Timothy Obizu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Thousands of Tunisians took to the streets of the capital Tunis over the weekend to protest against President Kais Saeed, who they blame for a severe economic crisis, including food shortages and soaring inflation. Led by the National Salvation Front, a coalition of opposition parties, demonstrators called on the president to step down. Radwan Masmoudi, president of Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy in Washington, discussed with VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi the significance of the rising tide of protest in Tunisia. I think there is a mounting anger and frustration among Tunisian population with Qais Saeed following the coup that he organized a year ago on July 25, 2021. Despite his initial promises in the beginning that he would respect the constitution and that he would address the economic and political and social crisis in the country, he has done, in fact, nothing of the sort. And he has done almost exactly the opposite. The situation in Tunisia has continued to worsen both politically and economically and socially. And it seems like Qais Saeed really does not have a vision or does not is not offering any real solutions to the Tunisian population. And I think this is what's driving the anger and the frustration that an increasing majority of Tunisians have toward Qais Saeed. And therefore, I think we're going to see more and more of these violent protests and demonstrations across the country as life is becoming intolerable under this dictator. Basic products such as flour, sugar, and coffee are in short supply, and crises such as the COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine have increased the cost of imports such as cereals. Why blaming the president for food shortages then? It's not just these external factors that are driving the rising costs. It's also the internal factors. The state institutions are crumbling in Tunisia. Nobody knows what the budget is of the various Tunisian governmental institutions. Taisa Saeed has put his hand on all the state institutions, including the budget, and he has total control over all these government institutions and their budget, and nobody really can hold him accountable. And he's not offering a solution. He's not offering a 
vision for solving these problems. And these problems seem to be getting worse. It seems like the only thing he cares about is the elections that are planned for next December because he wants to elect a fake parliament that will be like a rubber stamp that will approve all his policies without question and therefore he will have total control over everything. Okay, it's okay if you don't have the solution, at least include all the other political parties, all the other economic organizations and social organizations, include them in a dialogue that would at least explain to people what the crisis is and what the solutions are and would have more national unity that would facilitate the implementations of these policies. But Kai Sasai does not seem to care about inclusivity or about any real dialogue with anybody. Tunisia reached an agreement with the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to get a loan of about $1.9 billion. Experts say this low amount could, however, pave the way for economic and financial rescue and that the agreement with the IMF will allow Tunisia to access other sources of funding from World Bank, African Development Bank, Islamic Bank, and so forth. Could that satisfy the Tunisian people and boost President Kai Saeed's position? Yes, of course, it will boost his position without a doubt. But my fear is that it will not really solve any of these problems because, again, Kai Saeed does not have a vision and does not really have a plan for addressing these problems. Uh, my fear is that if the IMF gives the Tunisian regime the announced loan of $1.9 billion over four years, it will only extend the life of this dictatorship and without really solving the economic situation or improving the economic situation. And I think the the root causes of this terrible economic crisis are deep and they require not only a vision, but national unity, a national dialogue so that everybody knows what these reforms are and everybody understands why they are needed. I don't think these reforms can be forced or because there will be a negative response. There will be a backlash among the population because they will be seen as simply being enforced by Qais Saeed without really explaining why they are needed and also without making sure that they are spread over the entire population. Certain segments of the population will feel that they are underprivileged and that they are being unduly bearing the cost of these reforms. My fear is this loan will not really solve the problem. I think it will make it worse. And I think that it will push Tunisia more toward a worsened economic uh, crisis and also political instability. That was Radwan Masmoudi, President of Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy in Washington, speaking with VOA's Mohammed al Shinawi. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Please note we have moved our programs from voanews.com to voaafrica.com. There, you'll find all your favorite VOA radio and TV programs and a whole lot more. Find us on voaafrica.com. Moroccan police have arrested 25 African migrants near the border of a Spanish enclave, where at least 23 people died in June in a crossing attempt. The French news agency AFP says 25 migrants from Sudan and Chad were detained Sunday near the Milila land border with the European Union. An official told the news service that the migrants used violence as they were arrested. Since the attempt by migrants to enter the enclave in June, Morocco has sentenced dozens of migrants to prison terms for illegal entry and belonging to criminal gangs. The Moroccan Association for Human Rights says authorities should be protecting asylum seekers rather than arresting them. AFP notes that under international law, migrants have a right to claim asylum and it is prohibited to return potential asylum seekers to where their lives might be in danger. As fighting rages in northern Ethiopia and the government vowing to seize control of airports and other sites in the country's Tigray region, United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres has warned the situation in Tigray is spiraling out of control. William Davison is a senior analyst for Ethiopia at the International Crisis Group. I first asked him to talk to us about the latest in Ethiopia's Tigray region. 
conflict in, in Tigray region. We've seen significant military advances by the Eritrean and Ethiopian forces in recent days, including the taking control of Shire, um, the second largest city in Tigray. But this has also been accompanied by the bombardment of residential areas, reports of mass displacement, and some claims of atrocities against civilians. Mr. Guterres and, and others, including crisis group, are very worried that we will see continued resistance uh, of a different form from Tigray's forces. Um, and we have stated commitment from the federal authorities. They want to try and take control of Tigray, essentially, you know, which means more fighting to come. And it, it is likely um, that civilians will increasingly be targeted and, and trapped in the middle of this conflict situation. But Mr. Davison, Prime Minister Rabi is saying uh, in a statement that he, he is committed to the peaceful resolution of the conflict through the AU-led uh, peace talks. He, he's not really addressing the ceasefire call. What is really the intention of the Ethiopian government? It looks like a, a blitzkrieg is going on uh, in that area right now. Well, uh, yes, I think the, the, obviously the federal government, um, it, its position is that uh, for various reasons, it wants to reestablish federal authority over Tigray. The problem is that that's going to face the continued resistance um, from, the, from the Tigray authorities and, and their forces. Um, and that campaign seems to have plenty of popular support in Tigray. Um, and so, you know, yes, that's what the, the federal government is saying. They're still committed to the AU process. But that seems to be a rather nominal commitment when the activity on the ground is continued military operations, likely to face this fierce resistance and, and likely to lead to increased targeting of civilians, um, but particularly by the Eritrean and Ethiopian forces. What is Eritrea's uh, main goal? But the problem, one of the problems with the Eritrean government is it's not clear um, about what its activities are, let alone what its objectives, your justification. But we can assume that you know, seeing as Eritrea's leadership are uh, your arch enemies of the TPLF, the Great Ruling Party, and their leadership, that they are looking to essentially completely eliminate the TPLF as a political force. Um, also, I think they want to downsize Tigray um, itself. Um, they see these Tigray forces as an existential threat to Eritrea. There's also a long term sort of political rivalry between the two political communities as well. And so that seems to be the, the sort of objective that they have in mind, but we cannot be clear because um, they are not forthcoming about their activities. So what what do you see in the next uh, few days or weeks? The end game, what is it? Well, it's very hard to tell. There's, there's a number of different scenarios, of course. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that we can be fairly sure about um, now is that we will see continued Eritrean and Ethiopian federal offences. There will be continued uh, serious, sustained armed resistance, widespread armed resistance from the Tigray forces. And there's likely to be a lot more bloodshed. We can assume that the international community, you know, actors such as the US, European Union, they will try and increase the pressure um, and, and try and get the, 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 the Alitabwa and Asmara to call off this offensive. But we don't know yet whether that will be successful. So unfortunately, the likelihood is that we, we, we will see um, more fighting, more bloodshed, more targeting of civilians. But exactly you know, how things will unfold um, on the battlefield, will the federal government be able to take control of, of Mekele, Tigray's capital in short order, um, that type of thing. Um, that's a little bit hard to, to foresee and, and predict. William Davison is a senior analyst for Ethiopia, the International Crisis Group. He spoke to me from Kenya's capital, Nairobi. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce's U.S. Africa Business Center is holding its first Africa Digital Innovation Competition for African Startups. VOA is a media partner with the Africa Business Center on this initiative. Out of 17,000 candidates in 50 countries in Africa, the top 10 finalists have been decided, and for the next two weeks, we will bring you a look at each one. Today, we hear from Benjamin Baisisi Seyudu from Ghana. He is company Trade Rex is helping farmers and their com in their communities boost production and sale by connecting them to international markets. <music> I'm Benjamin Baisisirdu. I'm 32 years old from Accra, Ghana. I'm the CEO and co-founder of TraderX Ghana Limited. Now the digital innovation competition is to us a prestigious um, 
competition and also gives a cash investment. Uh, I think furthermore, it also um, provides its winners with uh, mentorship and that for us, you know, is more than we actually were looking for. So it was more than a perfect fit for us. The distinction to be a part of the top 10 in the whole of Africa uh, for us really validates the potential of our mission and our vision at TraderX to support uh, smallholder farmers in Africa. So TraderX is basically an agricultural commodity trading company. Essentially, what we are actually doing is uplifting smallholder farmers and their communities by elevating their production and boosting trade of their commodities to the wider international markets, and we are doing that through formalized exchanges. Um, for the farmers, uh, we are supporting them and providing them with services that will improve their yields, will reduce their post-harvest losses, and ultimately help them to earn more and do less manual work. For the market right now, as the world is clamoring for new sources of commodities, you know, Trader X is connecting local farmers to the wider international market to meet this demand. The first thing we will do if we win the competition, we will celebrate. Having an endorsement or this type of endorsement from such a prestigious third party will be invaluable to our fundraising efforts. That was Benjamin by C.C. Edu from Ghana, founder of Thread Rex, which is one of the ten finalists in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's first Africa digital innovation competition for African startups. We'll hear from all ten finalists over the next several days. And you can check out voaafrica.com for all the competitors and the winners who will be announced late this month. The search is on for Africa's best and brightest minds in finance, cybersecurity, technology, and anything digital. Making social impact through cutting-edge technologies, innovation, and creativity in Africa. Out of 17,000 candidates from 50 countries in North, Central, East, West, and Southern Africa, only three will be selected from the top 10 continental finalists from Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Cameroon. Join the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and its prestigious partners, including the Voice of America, when the three finalists are featured at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in December 2022 in Washington. Stay tuned. And that wraps up this edition of African News.